The other day I was trying to figure out whether it's my 49th or my 50th year in teaching. And uh, going back, I really always loved being with young people. Always. I have been telling anxious parents all year that not letting your kid go on a trip like this for three weeks to Eastern Europe was the easy thing to do. The difficult thing to do would be to let them go. But the relationship between the two of you would be that much stronger. I had to swallow my own words as I realized how difficult this proved to be. Our third chaperone and van driver was none other than Mr. Brent Servies, a longtime faithful friend of Edgar's. He lovingly described his old friend much like Teddy Roosevelt. He always had to be the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every Christmas. After a few tearful goodbyes, it was time for us to begin our trip. Everyone was a little excited and anxious, but we were on our way. First, I was beginning to wonder if our students would really be able to disconnect. But little did I realize we would all come back changed people. After moving through security, Poppy had some last minute instructions for us as we began our big adventure. Probably on this trip, have more freedom than you've ever had before. Okay, guaranteed. But it, there, there are conditions to them. I'm not joking around. When it comes to your safety, uh, what I tell you, you do. This is my 250th transatlantic flight today. Imagine it, <laughs> 250 times going from the United States. From it was here Edgar reminded us of our mantra on this trip, others first. Thinking in terms of me, self, that, that, is, that is over. Remember one thing, it's not me, it's others, it's others, people. We're 26 and for each one of you, the 25 are the others. We really take care of one another. As we waited for our luggage after a long flight to Munich, we were all very tired, but we were all in very good spirits. As Papi Sudek led by example, he reminded us that part of traveling, the most important part, is meeting the people along the way. I don't think Papi ever met a stranger he didn't know, although the kids didn't seem very impressed. As we got on our long train ride to our hostel, we were barely hanging in there, but we were hanging nonetheless. Now that we were checked into our hostel, it was time to start exploring the city, but it didn't take long for a few of us to get lost in the first few minutes of our arrival. Take a picture of the guilty face. I've got him. It was also interesting to notice and with all the freedom in the world to explore the city, most of the kids just came back to hang out with us, these old teachers. You getting tired? You ready for the sack? <laughs> After a good night's sleep and a full breakfast, we were all eager to get going on our tour and start exploring the city. Munich awaits us. Early into our first day of touring, Poppy had to remind the students to keep your money safe, keep your wallets in your front pockets as we already had one of our students had their cell phone stolen. Every day, probably 200 Mercedes-Benz and Audis get stolen in your Again, Poppy likes to make friends with the people he meets, and you might as well make friends with the local police while you're at it. The students begin to see what kind of fun it can be to meet the locals of where they're traveling. I asked him if he would fight over any of our girls. He says, I'm married. If I, to defend her, you will. You too. You too. Okay. Thank you. Little did this street performer know that there would be some debate over who the real clown was in this photo. And now we are ready for our first tour of Munich, and with our very own tour guide. It turned out to be a lot of walking. But the kids were pretty game for anything. Everything's like really awesome. All the people singing and playing instruments and stuff all in the streets. And then some more walking. Walking by beer gardens, walking by everything. And of course, meeting people along the way. 
and being thousands of miles from home, we made sure to take time to see a familiar face or two. And we walk some more, and we walk some more, and we walk some more. But we didn't let that dampen our spirits as we were here to see some things and touch a few things for good luck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and of course, we ended our day with more walking. Proving to be no exception, our next day began very early. And after a tour of the BMW plant, there were no complaints from the kids as we rested in a nearby park before taking in a few more sites. Poppy was on a 23-day mission to give these kids all Europe had to offer never wasting a single moment. And although we didn't bring our bathing suits, Poppy had another idea of how we could all get in the water. And while the locals showed us how it's done, Poppy was there as usual with some great advice. Shanae, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Try to walk fast like this guy did. Hold on. Okay. I'm very tired. We had lots of fun last night. Yeah. I got chocolate for everyone to share and they were happy. And we went walk around town and our feet are killing us right now and yesterday. And Janae, who has insomnia, actually got to sleep because she's so tired from everything. So she was happy about that. And I love Munich and I can't wait to explore. After long jam-packed days and a five hour drive to the Czech Republic, we were all tired and a little giddy. Uh, are we in? 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 I guess you could say there were times where we didn't know where in the world we were. Australia? I mean, Austria. On the side of the road. After a few more hours of driving, we did make one more stop before getting to Prague. We arrived at the old Prague hostel, located in downtown Prague. Although it was a great location, we had to walk up three sweltering flights of stairs, eight people per room, and still, no air conditioning. Then it was time for some more walking as we explored the beautiful yet confusing streets of Prague. I actually kind of wish America did that way. They put a little bit more time into the details of the housing and stuff. Some of the stuff... Some of these buildings look really gorgeous. And I'm looking at America like, we don't do this. We just make things big. It was like, yeah. oh, it's big. We're done. We're so modern. <laughs> Here, it's all like old-fashioned. We, we need more old-fashioned stuff in America. Because it's cool looking. Jesse, could you say that bit of wisdom again, please? I feel like it's a bad place to be exchanging money right now. OK, people, everybody else right now gets a 1,000 more crowns from me, OK? That means that I'm even with... After handing out our money for the evening, Poppy reminded us of a few things. Go out, have fun, explore the city, and let our hair down a little bit. But above all, keep our heads about us, and let's remember to be safe. Hold on to your bags. People, with these many tourists, this is pickpocket town, okay? Uh, wherever you go, and I suggest you... you explore all those little side streets a city tour we will have tomorrow with a guide don't worry about the history or anything like that that will be explained tomorrow tonight you just go out have fun sit down enjoy yourself okay and have fun we did we saw bachelor parties and weddings and we didn't even have to leave the main square so max what would you do between bungee jumping and uh what was the other one skydiving Probably skydiving. Skydiving? Barely. I do Barely. <laughs> Push your mouth to play. Yeah. Bye. Change, right? yeah. Now you know not to go skydiving with her because she gets a minute she'll push you off the plane. Yeah, if you're like, if you start to go and then you pause and like. Yeah, we were really starting to get to know each other. That's for sure. I would never talk. No, I would scream at you and then never talk to you again. So you you wouldn't be able to scream. You'd be falling. I said, if I survive. What the heck are you eating over there? Uh, goulash. Goulash. <laughs> Do you know what goulash is exactly? Check dish. Adam boy. <laughs> <laughs> Janae, what did you get? Goulash. I've heard of that before. <laughs>
It's beef, onions, peppers, and bread. So, um, Prague, Munich. I like Prague. Yeah, like you like Prague? It's nice and cool. It's calm. It's calm. And the people understand us. Yes. It's a lot easier to, uh, like, talk to them and ask questions. The money keeps making me really mad because I feel like I'm spending a lot. Yeah. Not. That's why I got a converter on my cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to prepare for this trip. So you know you're spending a lot instead yeah. of just making yeah. it <laughs> Because we stayed so busy on this trip, we always seemed to find ourselves in the right place at the right time, including getting to catch an impromptu Bobby McFerrin concert. It turns out, the checks, they don't worry, they just be happy. Derek, what'd you guys have for dinner uh, tonight? Uh, I had a burger. Yeah. Good old American burger. You can't yeah. get that back at home. Nope. <laughs> burger. Fries, the whole Burger, American fries, ketchup, uh, slaw, soda, the best apple pie the for the food in all the places we've been. What's been the best food so far? Oh, that. What we had today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. today. Yeah. I think it's the burger. It was way easier to know where to go in Munich. Like, I thought here, so it's way different because there's all side streets and all that. Yeah. I didn't like Germany that much. As much Who, as I thought I would. That? Oh, you didn't? No. Really? I like this uh, better. The people the are so much nicer. Like, Poppy was wearing the kids out. Our schedules had been jam-packed since we got here. And while they had caught catnaps wherever they could, Poppy rarely got more than four hours of sleep a night. He spent most of his time arranging for the next day or the next event. Oftentimes, weather or other unforeseen problems would arise as Poppy would make changes without missing a beat. Be a part of Czechoslovakia, which was a common state of Czechs and Slovaks. And Czechoslovakia... We had fantastic tour guides in Prague. And at every twist and turn, we had a new history lesson. The kids hung on every word. ...separated again in 1993 in what is called the Velvet Divorce. It was called Velvet Divorce because the Czechs and Slovaks separated without violence, as opposed to other post-communist breakups where, unfortunately, violence was involved. On this tour today, we're going to be looking at the Prague Castle, and I'll try and show you the beauty of the Prague Castle and how important, how significant it is. Our tour guides in Prague were very good. They were so passionate about everything they said, and everything had a story. Right there. It's named after our most important king, our greatest king ever. He ruled over this country. It was a big, hot hike to get to the top of the castle, but the views from the top were absolutely amazing. The kids were hot and tired, but they were still ready to see some more attractions. It was our last night in Prague and we were all very tired, but we were excited to get to Vienna, the home of our very own Papi Sudek, who paid attention to the smallest of details. People look carefully. All right. Uh, anybody's yellow soapbox. It was left in the bathroom. And then we piled back into our vans, nine or ten people in each van. We were exhausted, and at the end of the trip we would log over 3,000 kilometers driving across Eastern Europe. Along our five or six hour drive to Vienna, we managed to squeeze in one last stop. The original Budweiser Brewery, located in Budvar. Again, we had another great tour guide, as the Czechs turned out to be some of the most accommodating and sweetest people we met along the way. We learned about distribution and how beer was made. Opposite to us, second one is under us. And uh, they are walking according to timetable. In this place, uh, uh, there are three shifts. So they are preparing uh, beer 24 hours per day. We went from the hot, humid vat rooms down to the icy cellars. <laughs> you put them over your ears. Down here, we were able to sample the local taste. And we also met some people that really, really loved their jobs. Approximately 50 years. 50 years. 50, we drink to him. <laughs> Best love. As we said our goodbyes to Bud Bar, to we also had a few apologies to make. My dad's favorite beer is Budweiser. Like, ever. That's all he ever drinks. So I wanted to get him a shot glass, but I didn't have enough. <laughs> After Bud Bar, we packed back into our vans and headed for Vienna, the old stomping grounds of our very own Poppy Sudek. <laughs> we had arrived in Vienna at the Hostel Hutteldorf, one of our favorites. 
As expected, uh, our time in Vienna was one history lesson after another. The central square of the Roman fortress on which Vienna is built. Vienna was called Wien Dobona, Good Winds, and here was the Command and Chief's parade ground 2,000 years ago. Three Roman legions gathered here, and the result of that, people, was what? It was Maximus. It was the gladiator, okay? It was Russell Crowe fighting the Germans across the river. That happened right here. Stephanie, what are you doing here? It's a payphone. What's a payphone? I don't know. It's not like, a cell phone, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you can use, like, coins. The other one is Schiller. Schiller is the one, if you were in my class, when I played Beethoven, the Ninth Symphony. You may remember copying Beethoven, uh, who, who made the poem, The Ode to Joy, which Beethoven then used in the Ninth Symphony. The children of uh, Virginia, how were they? Were they very polite? Did they? Were they? Uh, uh, so yes, yes. Were they well behaved? Yes. Very, very, yes. yes. Very nice. Thank you for everything. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sven. What's been your favorite city between Munich, Prague and Vienna. Prague. Prague, why? Yeah. I like the look of the town, even though I could never find my way around. I always followed everybody else. And I like the feel of it and how it was all around the one center instead of like a strip, it was a circle. How does it compare to US and what you've seen so far? I think architecture is beautiful. It's better than plain old buildings like we have in US. What do you like about Vienna? That we're in a rotating restaurant. It doesn't like, hurt, right? <laughs> that's freaking awesome. Prague. Prague. Yes. Why? Well, just the architecture was beautiful and the people were just polite. So. Probably Prague and Vienna, my favorites. What do you like about those two cities? Well, in Prague, the people were really nice compared to Germany. And here, I just like the, the hostel and where everything <laughs> is. Can, can you describe the hostel a little bit for anybody? Um, we have Wi Fi in the rooms. <laughs> We arrived at Schomburn Palace in time to see a few animals, but just in time for the rain as well, which forced us indoors for a while. Yeah, Who's that behind you on the wall? Right here. I'm a monkey. Um, France, Joseph, right? And he's emperor. And who's across the way from him, looking at him? Well, we yeah, Mrs. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. 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 France. Joseph. Mrs. France, Joseph. <laughs> which was at that time outside the city walls, okay? All right, a story again of an emperor saying if one of the many plagues that hit a city would stop, okay, he would build a cathedral in the honor of God. And look what it says in Latin. Vota mea in, uh, redam in conspectu dimentium deum, okay? I return my vow in view of the fearfulness or the, the impressiveness of God. Okay. When in Vienna, it's a must to take in a Mozart concert. There were no cameras allowed inside the auditorium once the concert started, but we were the only ones that really played by this room. So Amanda, you've been to your first uh, Mozart concert in Vienna? Yes. What do you think? It was awesome. Awesome in what way? Awesome in that, I don't know, it was just relaxing and it was nice to because it's not something that you hear every day, so it was nice to go and enjoy something that I felt would be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Let me ask you this. You have to be honest. Yes. Did you fall asleep at all? I did. <laughs> but not in a bad way. It was relaxing. So relaxing. So I just fell asleep, and I woke up. I did wake up, and it was very good. <laughs> fall asleep? No, I didn't. She didn't. I kept her up though. It's so calming, it like puts you to sleep. So even though I liked it, I fell asleep. Did you recognize any song? I did. I don't know the names of them, unfortunately, but I did, like the did ones. Did you hum a song or? The one that's like da 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 dum 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 dum. That one. <laughs> it was a good experience. I enjoyed it. And honestly, did you fall asleep at any time? No, I'm very good at staying awake. You know, school prepares you for that. <laughs> 
I really liked it. Considering I already liked classical music, I like it even more. Did you have a favorite tune? Yeah, the third one, I think. I don't know what it's called. It's called Mozart's Third. Yeah. While in Vienna, we are all fortunate enough to meet Edgar's little brother, Ernsty, a two-time Olympian in track and field for Austria. And he proved to be just as affable as his older sibling. Uh, remember, these are city schools. This is the inner district. There were probably about 20 of those buildings, three, four stories high, okay? With a lot of kids in them. Now, towards the end of the World War II, most of them were bombed out. So they stopped school and started the following year with a morning and an afternoon shift. Morning went from 7 to 12, then there was one hour break, and then from 1 to 5 or 1 to 6. And they did that for several years until they had reconstructed a lot of school building. So once I was done with elementary school in this building, okay, I moved into this building, and that is my high school, okay? You can only imagine the kids' enthusiasm as we told them our final destination was walking to high school. So we flew halfway around the world so you guys could go to school. Uh -huh. First international singing experience. Right on, sister. We're looking forward to it. Thanks. We're going to get it on tape so you'll be famous. We're in Europe right now. More, more famous. More famous. It's very different from our school. And then what's different about it? It looks like it's more compact. And what? More compact. More compact? Yeah. Like our lobby is, is way bigger than this and it's like one floor. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think about high school in uh, Austria compared to Fauquier County? It doesn't even look like a school here. What does it feel like? A hostel. A hostel? Yeah. Looks like everybody's having a pretty good time. Yeah. It's also the last day of school, that helps. Oh, is it? I think so. What do you think about high school in uh, Austria compared to high schools in Virginia? It looks cool. I think I can answer that question better after we, like, walk around. Have you noticed anyone with their cell phone out here? No. No one. I haven't seen anyone. I'm more laid back. More laid back. Did you go here? No. I still go to Liberty, but... I think that they have a lot more freedom. I don't know. It just seems more like fun and happy. It seems like a happier place than in Fauquier County. Did you see yourself going to school here? Yeah, I could. I think it would be a lot more fun. Do you want to break that to your parents that you're going to go to school here in Austria now? Or? I don't know. I think they'd be a little disappointed. They'd be a little bit upset. Now, what do you think about uh, high, high school in the city versus high school in the country? Um, I, I don't know. I think they kind of know their way around more than other people. Like they kind of go by themselves and do. Would you miss your horses? Yes, I would. So, you know, I'd ride my horse to school, maybe. <laughs> park out front. Park horse, out front, yeah. Make sure you're in the horse park. Yeah. Like politics, school, education, so that they can exchange their views and ideas. Exactly. What we have planned for you today is we're going to split you up in little groups and you're going to get a tour around our school. After the tour, uh, we will be going to the Stadtpark. Okay. Introduce yourselves. At first, our students weren't exactly sure how to mingle, but they quickly warmed up to the Austrian students. While the kids were busy mingling, Edgar took the opportunity to look at his old school records, and I began to realize why he's so passionate about sharing this experience with his students. Everything, everything done by handwriting. I noticed uh, you're sitting in front of a computer screen, but we're reading a book, right? I know, <laughs> a, a, an ancient book. Edgar, how does it feel coming back to your old high school, the nostalgia of it? I think that the setup of our schools in the United States is much better somehow, you know? In mathematics, you got a sufficient... Altogether, this is a very bad uh, report card. This isn't Mr. Sudek's report card, right? Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay, Sudek, Edgar, born April 8th, 1939, in Vienna, Austria. Citizenship Austrian. Uh, yes. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go to the grades. Okay, this is my grades. German, I was good. In English, I was very good. In Latin, which I now teach, I was satisfactory, which would be a D. Okay, it's amazing. And see how many different subjects there were. We had up to 13 or 14 subjects a year. This just reads: history, geography, natural history, physics, chemistry, math. 
uh, geometric drawing, um, uh, philo philosophy, uh, drawing and painting. Okay. What, what advice would you give to your students now that you look back and see what your grades were like in school? I would, I would just say that I was no different than any one of them except we did have to work harder and every grade here that I had even if it's a poor grade they would fail because we had daily homework I came home and for two or three hours sat down but we also I understand the dilemma we had no distractions we had no distractions Edgar what a can you, can you talk a little bit about how your parents were as far as your education and how they... It was totally expected that uh, we did try very hard in school. And they would not in any ways, my parents would not have taken any excuse. If I came home and said this teacher was mean, my parents would have instantly said, what did you do? I know you were a very well-behaved student, but I did hear a rumor about... Uh, I was not really well-behaved. I, I heard a rumor about a, a, a small fire that might have happened in one of your classes. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? <laughs> Where did you hear that? From one of my students, I'm sure. Okay. Well, uh, we had this really fantastic, these long uh, matches. And if you wet the end of it, they stuck together and we made, we were so fond of American, everything America, okay, United States. So we made little Indian teepees out of them, okay. And then if you set fire to the top, which consisted of seven or eight matches, okay, it would flare up and the smell of sulfur would permeate the whole room. And the teachers right away knew that somebody had made a little fire in your desk, okay. And uh, for some reason that... Uh, Maybe I've tried to forget. They always said, Sudek, come raus, come out, okay? I was the one, and 90% of the time they were right. Teachers saw some hope in me, okay? And the very fact that uh, I became a teacher and love what I'm doing to this day probably vindicates their trust in me. You, you know? think they would be, be proud of you today? I, I think if they saw me and my relationship with my students, they might be very proud. Two or three of them, I emulate myself because they were always full of humor. They were always ready with a pat on the shoulders and uh, uh, I remember them fondly. Would you say you're a better teacher because you knew what worked for you as far as the teachers that influenced Abs you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, bombings in Vienna started on a very heavy scale uh, in the winter, uh, in the spring of 1944. I started first grade in the fall of 1944 and uh, after two months they cancelled all classes and the Germans sent all moms and kids to the countryside to be safe from the bombings. Our apartment right here in the inner district was uh, bombed out. We moved to another apartment which was also bombed but not completely. So we lived in a partially bombed out apartment. I was sitting in the basement when a bomb went off two, three hundred meters away and it blew out my right eardrum, the concussion. And. Uh, well, they, my mom took me to the hospital after the bombing raid was over and there were no doctors. The doctors were all at the front, okay? So there were religious nurses, sisters, uh, and she poured some drops in my ears and sent me home. It never healed. That's why to this day, all my teaching career, I've been deaf on my right ear. Having his name on the list that he had seen, my father disappeared. My mom had no clue where he was because the idea was if they had come for him, he was not there, they might have possibly tortured my mom. The, the first time you saw your father again when he came back? From oh, home? My, my God, he was just sitting in the, in the apartment, you know? He was sitting smoking a cigarette, okay, one of these self-rolled uh, cigarettes, and with Russian tobacco, which just smelled like uh, rotten cowhide, okay? The, the, it was amazing, and uh, there was, and he said, no, nah, you're sad, schon da. No, well, you guys are back again, you know. So it was daddy, daddy, and we, and my father was not a person that could show effusive love, but the tears came into his eyes, you know. And how old were you and your brother then? Um, I, um, I was uh, seven and uh, my brother was five. 
most good sons will say that the best person in their lives was mommy. There's just nobody like her. I was beginning to realize just how much this trip meant to Edgar and how much he wanted to share this gift with his students. She was always there for us, always. She never scolded us. Meanwhile, our students were mixing and mingling in the park with the Austrian students. Edgar had arranged for Sarah to sing some more songs for us, some in German and some in English. Very well. <laughs> I just, I had her add me to Facebook and I was separate. What, what is this Facebook thing everybody keeps talking about? <laughs> well, apparently, Facebook is perfect for such a thing. Yeah. Exactly. For just I've never used my Facebook, but now I have a reason to. I think we could consider the mingling of our students a success, as neither group wanted to separate. But Poppy had us stuck to a very strict schedule, and another unique experience awaited us. The kids had no idea about the history they were about to witness. It would change some of them forever. Then had horrible experiences in World War II that he's going to tell you about. As Edgar introduced his friend Herbie, you could tell how proud he was of having such a remarkable man as such a close friend. Met his wife, married, had nothing else to do except make some children, okay? <laughs> and, uh, Herbie was an amazing man with an incredible sense of humor. But he also had a story to tell. No, I don't. My story. You told my story. I did not tell your story, Herbert. If you want to fight about it, go ahead. And if you know your history, I'm sure Edgar uh, told you about the Austrian history before he got you here to Vienna, did you? Not much. Not much? Then you should be fired. <laughs> Herbie, weren't both your parents murdered? Your, both your parents were murdered in one of the concentration camps. Right. The whole family. The whole family. Yeah. Aunts, uncles, nephews, relatives, cousins, everybody. So that's that's a known fact. That how do you get six million people killed? I was uh, in a concentration camp for four years. I was in uh, camps in Austria, in Latvia, in Riga. I was in a camp in uh, in Germany. Not I, but two different camps in Germany, and we finally. After the war ended in 1945, we got liberated, I got liberated in a concentration camp by the name of Buchenwald. How did your experience in the concentration camp change you as a person? How would you be different if that whole thing hadn't happened? Good question. I would say that in the days of life in the camp, you become an animal. You survive like an animal in the jungle. You survive every day. You steal, you do anything you can to live. And uh, the transition, like you say, from that life into normal life was difficult. Society, wherever you come from, where you choose to go to, and when you get there, you gotta remember there are laws and there are ways a society exists. So you have to forget about stealing things. You have to forget about organizing things which don't belong to you. You have to learn to become a, a responsible citizen. Yeah. And that was difficult. We start for four years. I weighed, what did I weigh? 30 30 kilos. 36 kilos. 36 kilos, he weighed about 70 pounds. 70 pounds when I was liberated. People, imagine this man, or you, any one of you weighing 80 pounds with a previous weight of maybe probably 150. Yeah. Half, half size. Anyway, but anyway, that was hungered us for you. We hungered and we hungered and we hungered for four years with nothing to eat. We ate grass and we ate, we chewed stones, you know, we, we did anything uh, to organize food. Uh, it was uh, every day, you know, it was a battle where you get something from somewhere, you know, to exist. Think about that, what Mr. Schwartz says, when we take back piles of food, 
right here in Austria into the kitchen on our plates, okay? Eating grass, okay? Licking, list, literally, I've read stories and I'm sure Mr. Schwartz has experienced that. Licking the mildew and the moss of stones to get you something into your system. What was the specific luck, the specific twist of fate that enabled you to survive? I remember at one time that was specifically on my birthday. And I remember the day uh, I was at a camp in a barracks and I was, I would say, just about ready to keel over. I, I gave up. I was ready. I could not make two steps into the block. So, so I, I was finished. And there came a guy, and a Viennese guy from also from another block in the camp, who happened to know me. And I don't know until today. I don't know how he knew me. And he took me out and transferred me from that miserable place where I was into the major camp, which was somewhere else where there are more established uh, blocks and not with come and go. Okay. And I would say that he saved my life. What? Certain situations, you know, where people got in a, in a railroad car, a family, and uh, they didn't know where they were going, and they didn't have water, and they didn't have food, and uh, they didn't give them anything. Yeah, and they were actually making a hole in the bottom of the rail of the, the, the car. You know, as they were standing there taking turns with some pocket knives or something to make a hole big enough to fall out of the railroad car on the tracks. The hole was finally big enough for a child to pass through and the parents gave up their children and made them push them, you know, into that railroad, uh, in that hole where the train was stopped or somewhere and they tried through the hole to fall in the railroad track and then tried to run into woods and somehow to save themselves, okay? I mean, that was heroic I mean, to, to, to actually do something like that. Was it age eight? Was leaving uh, Vienna with a thing around her neck to England, to a country she didn't know, to people she didn't know, to the language she didn't know, and she was, the parents gave the children up. And there's some terrible, terrible, of stories and that uh, documentary, how parents, you know, actually gave up their children. Saved them by yeah. giving them up. Yeah, well, that was a very, uh, there's more to it than that. Because you see, including my wife, those children were damaged children. And the damage was that the children, really not knowing anything about politics, had no idea why are they actually on a train with other children. They didn't have no idea. They were just like cattle, okay? And they were told later on, they would send them away for their own safety, otherwise they would have gone into the gas, which is true. I don't know how to put this to you, but I went through with my wife, yeah, through some terrible times. She would not talk to her parents. She never, never, forgave her parents that they were sent her away to the last day. Herbie Schwartz left an indelible mark on our students, changing their perspectives and shifting their paradigms forever.